Sherry Castle is a popular food writer, cook, chef, teacher, uh, well known throughout this region of North Carolina. She celebrates the pleasures of fresh local and seasonal foods and now she's put all of this learning together in a brand new book called The New Southern Garden Cookbook. We're going to talk to her about that book and get some good ideas for how we can use the wonderful foods that are available to us in North Carolina. We'll do all that on North Carolina Book Watch next. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV, and by the North Carolina Humanities Council. Welcome to North Carolina Book Watch. My guest is Sherry Castle, and she's the author of a brand new book, The New Southern Garden Cookbook. Welcome, Sherry Castle. Thank you so much. I love the subtitle of your book even as much as the title, and I have to read it, though. Uh, enjoying the best from homegrown gardens, farmers markets, roadside stands, and CSA farm boxes. It's a mouthful, but I needed to say all of that. Why did you need to say all of that? Well, you know, it really gives a, a synopsis of what the book is about, that between our gardens we might grow and our proliferation of wonderful farmer's markets across the state, and maybe some produce from some neighbors and maybe a CSA box, you can eat from a garden without having to till the soil yourself. <laughs> you don't have to get your hands dirty. That's right. Well, you and I have talked before, and I've said, what is a CSA, a CSA farm box? Is that... Confederate States of America? No, no, you know, you were the first to suggest that. And I think that is so mm. funny that someone else had not asked me that. But it actually stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And it's a very simple premise. A person could subscribe to a farm, like subscribing to a magazine. And that farmer, usually a small family farmer, maybe a cooperative of growers, will give you a weekly delivery of farm fresh, garden fresh produce. It's like subscribing to your own farm. And it's a great idea because it gives the farmers an outlet for their work and it gives the consumer, the family, or the person a direct connection to local food. Well, it's kind of like a chef's choice uh, in the sense that you trust the farmer to give you the freshest, most available don't know exactly what it's going to be every it can, week, but it'll be good. Right. It can be a bit of a surprise and so forth, which is one of the reasons I wrote the book, but it will be good because it's from your community, and of course they want to give their consumers the best they have. Well, we'll talk about farmers markets and roadside stands and, the, and, and, and the getting your dirty garden, mm -hmm. uh, but in that, con that context, I'm going to ask you the question, and we've already given part of the answer mm -hmm. is, what is it, why do we need another southern cookbook and what have you done differently that people haven't done before? Well I think that the thing that I did differently that I've not seen very often if at all is the way I organize the book. It is organized by the fruit and the vegetable. It's a apples through zucchini. There are about 40 categories and so if you go to your backyard garden or the farmers market or even to the store and see things that are in their best form, the most abundant, the most ripe and luscious, the best value, you go to that and then you come home and decide what to do with it. Most people don't shop a farmers market with a grocery list or a recipe list. They shop with their eyes and their palate and they, they bring home what looks good to them. So. Uh like if we if we've got the CSA farm box mm -hmm. and something comes, right? Then you can go to your say it's asparagus this week or it's exactly. broccoli the next week. Then right. I can go to that uh, part of the book and find several alternatives about how to cook that book. Exactly, that exactly, vegetable. and how to incorporate it into the meals. You know, it's not just side dishes. It's not just vegetarian. It's really showing people motivation and creative ways to incorporate those fresh items throughout the day in their meals. Well, A is for apples. Let's yes. talk about apples. Yes. I, I found a recipe in there that I liked a lot about apples because it was simple. You know what I'm talking about? I bet it's, it's a, those skillet apples. Yeah, the skillet apples. <laughs> I thought it might be that. You know, that is a simple recipe. There are like three items to put in three there. Three items because, you know, when you start with good ingredients, you don't have to do a lot to keep them good. I mean, it really is the easiest way to cook well is to start with good ingredients. And the skillet apples, it's just little apples. Well, tell us about that. Just yeah, exactly. For, as a favor to me, talk right. about the skillet apples. Well, I use a cast iron skillet, but that's not a requirement. But 
you know, a nice skillet, a little butter or a little bacon drippings. You know, it's an old mountain recipe where they would take whatever little drippings they had in the skillet at the end of making breakfast, whether that was bacon, sausage, country ham, a pat of butter, whatever, and you cut up the apples, lay those wedges in the pan, and just let them soften. And you put a little sprinkling of sugar, just a dab, and a little salt. Some people put a little pinch of cayenne pepper for a little kick. And when they're done, they're, they hold their shape, they're tender on the inside, and they're slightly sticky and caramelized on the outside. And people ate them with their biscuits or with their hoe cakes or with their buckwheat pancakes. Some people wanted them warm. Some people put them on the back of the stove and came in and ate them at dinner time cold. Wow, wow. Well, uh, what, uh, <laughs> Give me some. Why do you bring some? <laughs> I should have done that. Sounds great. Uh, another one of my favorite vegetables that you t uh, that has a separate section mm -hmm. in your book is mm -hmm. cabbage. Yes. And cabbage yes. is uh, is available fresh in a wider season than some of the other it vegetables. It really is. Cabbage is just coming in. I'm seeing that in our markets now. And of course, up in the mountains and so forth, it's going to be available through the fall. And cabbage is really sort of uniquely southern and particularly uh, beloved in North Carolina because it grew so well. It was one of the first commodity crops where people could grow a little bit for their home use and then have enough left over to sell. And you know, we North Carolinians are geniuses with cabbage. We can roast them, we can pickle them, we can ferment it, we make our coleslaw that goes with our barbecue sandwiches. Such a simple, nutritious, humble vegetable that can be dressed up in all sorts of ways. And it was, it was prolific in our community. And they kept well. You know, mountain people used to actually bury them underground and they would preserve. If you bury them just below the frost line, they can keep throughout the winter. I remember well going out with my digging granddaddy up a and digging uh, up a cabbage <laughs> and the inside was snowy white and as good as the day it was put in the ground. Well, give me um, the easiest way to make a cabbage dish. To you cook know, other just, than just making slaw out of it. Uh, without yeah. making slaw, you know, you can um, cut it into wedges, leave it in wedges, put it in a pan, maybe with a little bit of chicken stock, cover that pot and put it in the oven and braise it. And it goes tender and brings out its inherent sweetness. And then it's a little wedge of cabbage. You know, it doesn't get slick. It keeps its sweet delicacy. And just put it on the plate as a little wedge of a side dish. I actually make um, inverted stuffed cabbage. You know how people used to stuff cabbage? cabbage rolls, well that takes a little work, so I just cook my cabbage, then make my meat mixture on the side and ladle it over the top like putting spaghetti sauce on spaghetti, except it's a wedge of cabbage. Wow. The other great North Carolina food um, is sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. also has an extended season. It does. And so you can get that fresh. Um, all, you know, uh, throughout the year. Right, even in our winter markets, you know, North Carolina, we have markets year round and sweet potatoes are a staple in those wintertime markets. It is so good and so prevalent that it's underused and mm -hmm. how do you encourage it? Give us encouragement to uh, use it in a way that we can pretend that it's the great expensive delicacy exactly. that it is, except for the fact that it's inexpensive. It is very inexpensive and it's a nutritional powerhouse. I mean, anytime you see a list of superfoods, sweet potatoes are going to be on there. My first premise is don't ever expose them to water. Either roast them and use the mashed pulp or cut them in wedges and roast them. But a lot of people used to boil their sweet potatoes, which does them no favors at all. It leaches out their flavor. It leaves them a little soggy and watery and it drains off their nutrients. So, you know, if well, I'm, I'm, it's wrong to boil them. And then it's, it's I mean, not, it's not it's I mean, not wrong, but you will get such better flavor and such better consistency if you roast them. If I'm making a pie or, you know, the ubiquitous sweet potato casserole for our Thanksgiving table, I'll just roast those potatoes, the peeling slides right off, and mash them up. Mash them up just with the back of a spoon, and it is the starting point for so many recipes. Or you can cut them into cubes and roast them like a pan of roasted vegetables and then make sweet potato home fries, maybe a nice little sweet potato and smoked trout hash. You can throw them in potato salad. I make potato salad with half white potatoes and half sweet potatoes all the time. What is the then what what is the different flavor? How would how would you describe the different flavor from a white potato versus a general white potato versus a sweet potato? Well, you know the sweetness. The sweet potato title gives us a, a clue. They, they have a wonderfully earthy, mildly sweet. They taste like autumn. There may be no food mm. that tastes like autumn more than a sweet potato. But you know, they're they're delicate, but they're not boring. And uh, they can be used in all sorts of different things. I put sweet potatoes in pound cake in the fall. Oh, well, all right, well now, we're gonna get to this. Okay. I, I got you here to talk about writing about yes. food, not about yes. food, but I'm, <laughs> but 
One of the things that you talk about is uh, an unusual way to make a pancake, mm -hmm. to make it a little bit crispier, and uh, pancakes are southern staple. You make it a mountain southern staple, I think, by putting some cornmeal or something yes, in it. Yes, among, among the several pancake recipes I have is one that has cornmeal in it. And it does, just a little bit to give it a crunch. It's still recognizable, fully a pound cake, but it's got a little bit of crunch. And what I like to say is, you know, we, we um, southerners are particular about our cornbread, and we tend to contend that real cornbread should not have sugar in it. And my grandmother used to say, well, if God had intended for cornbread to be sweet, he'd have called it cake. So I couldn't resist <laughs> a cornmeal pound cake. See, see it is cake. <laughs> well, that's story is a good segue into what I'm, I guess, I guess we need to do to be faithful to the purpose mm -hmm. of this program and it's about writing. Yes. And writing about food is a, I think, a special challenge. Mm -hmm. um, and you uh, do part of that by telling the story, in your book, the stories like about your grandmother. I can't, if it's, um, if, 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 if it, it would be cake or what is tell that story again? She said that if God wanted cornbread to have sugar in it, he'd have called it cake. And so I said, well, look, here's a cornbread pound cake. It right, is cake. Right. Well, there's a, a lot of your writing about food. Yes. Is framed by your experience growing up in North Carolina, in the mm -hmm. North Carolina mountains. Mm -hmm. And uh, that enriches it. Is how, how did you get started uh, on your cooking path and on your writing path and did they go in parallel? They parallel went in points? parallel but they weren't always in, in sight of one another. <laughs> you know, sometimes I would be more with one or the other. I mailed my first recipe to a TV cooking show when I was four years old. So I have been a lifelong cook. I just have to interrupt you because mm -hmm. um, I want to get the specifics for the people of my generation. This is WVTV in Charlotte. It was. And it's Betty Feaser. It was, was Betty Feaser, who was the Martha Stewart of her day. You know, did a homekeeping show. They came on right after the noon news and before the soap operas, which my, which my family called the stories, before <laughs> the stories came on. And it came on every day, and I watched her every day and wrote a recipe, wrote a story to go with it, drew a picture, and mailed it to her. And you're how old? Four. All right. Well, tell us the tell us the recipe and tell us the story well, if you can remember it. Yes, I do remember. It's now what we would call a smoothie. I called it Hawaiian Sunset Delight, but my grandmother had gotten a blender with green stamps. Remember when you used to yeah, get green yeah, stamps at yeah, the grocery yeah. store? We traded in green stamps for a uh, a new blender, and I put fruit and juice and things in it and made a concoction that we would now call a smoothie and mailed it off to Betty Feaser. And so I guess I from that day forward, I was a cook. I was always thinking about food. I found it interesting. But I certainly never thought I would do it professionally. I was trained as a writer. So I've written in a number of industries and other things. And I suppose when you have dual passions, inevitably they'll merge back together at some well, point. Well, what did you learn about writing that helps you frame the cookbook in a way that makes it more than just a collection of recipes? Well, there are two things. One, as you've mentioned, there are a lot of stories. I consider myself a storyteller at heart. It's just that the thing that I tell my stories about tend to be food-based things, food and culture. I think food, particularly Southern food, is extremely evocative. If you want to have a good conversation or even an impromptu conversation, ask somebody about something they like to eat or something that someone who loved them mm. made mm. for them mm. or whatever. It's, it's an instant conversation starter. So I had that sort of mindset and then I, um, by being a cooking teacher for all these years, I think I have a very conversational, helpful, you know, encouraging point of view in my recipe writing that make people feel like they're reassured that it's going to come out well. It's very conversational. The way I write on the page is the way I would tell you. If I bumped into you at the farmer's market and you said, so Sherry, how do you make so and so? I write to my readers the way I talk to my friends. Well, and did, where did you learn this? Was this at Watauga High School or, <laughs> uh, or at, in, at Appalachian or at Carolina or? Well, it was or, a little uh, bit of both. You know, I was, I always thought I was going to be a writer, but I thought I would write novels and short stories. It didn't occur to me until much later in life that I would write food-based stories and things. But, you know, I always was a writer. I enjoyed it. I came here to Carolina, you know, studied writing, thought I might be an English professor. And then uh, the whole time, that I was studying that as a profession, I was a cook at home and among my friends. I was known as, oh, Sherry, she's the good cook. Let's go to her house. And so when I made a career change about 15 years ago where I left the corporate world, I decided I was going to be a cooking teacher, that that's how I wanted to interact with people, not in a restaurant, but one-on-one -on -one, to teach people, you know, how to cook and to hear their stories and share my stories. And over time, I did other food writing from magazines, newspapers. I helped other 
other people write their cookbooks. And then at all, this book is the one that is mine from start to finish. Only my name, my point of view, my cooking philosophy, and it's, it's my story. Well, you're celebrating that, and we celebrate that with you, although sometimes the most more interesting stories come from working with other people. Right. And without, I don't want you to violate confidences or anything, but just in general, what, what did you do and what did you learn from working with other people on their books about food? Well, I learned that everybody appreciates clarity and that there are people that are highly gifted cooks that don't necessarily know how to put that on paper and convey it to a reader in a way that's enjoyable and reliable and so forth. So I help them, you know, mold the recipes, clarify them, give a point of view. Basically, it, I edit recipes and food and cookbooks the way a good editor would write any book. Does it accomplish what you want it to say? And you know, when you write anything, whether it's a two sentence thing or a massive book, you've got to know what is it really I intend to say here. And that is as valid for a food book as it is for the greatest novel. It has to say what you intend for it to say. Well, I think it's such a good point. And many of us are not going to be full time writers mm -hmm. about food or anything else, uh, but lots of us will have a dish or a family mm -hmm. uh, food that mm -hmm. we would like to share with other people. Right. And if without guidance, it's simply going to be a list of ingredients that we happen to remember or use mm -hmm. or have stolen from our mother or grandmother. Right. And with dashed off instructions about it that may or may not work. I, I, at least that's right. been my experience. That's how most I've family recipes are. And, mm -hmm. and so I'm, if I'm setting out on this project, how are you going to guide me as a writer and as a experienced food expert, what, do you, what are some of the guidelines that you're going to tell me just so that my little family cookbook can can be better? Well, I think, you know, it seems so simple, but sometimes people forget, especially those of us that were raised in a pinch of this or that kind of cooking environment, actually make sure that the ingredients are what are in the dish. You know, sometimes people will hold back and say, oh, you know, and then you put a little of this or that in it. Well, ask them, what do you mean by that? And, you know, tell me about that. You know, ask lots of questions. Make sure you really have the ingredients and then make sure in the instructions, whether there are a few words or a few paragraphs, that you are address each of those things. There should be a logical start and a logical end point and tips and hints along the way. And that sounds very rudimentary, but most family recipes don't really take you from start to finish because there was a presumption that you had watched that beloved grandmother make it many times or that you had a certain set of cooking skills and so forth. And um, after you have it written as clearly as you believe it should be, have someone else read it and see if they could use it to get from start to finish. One of the other things that um, popped out that was valuable for me in your recipe is that, that there's a difference between liquid measurements and dry measurements. Right. And it's not, uh, I, I started beating around about that and I couldn't find measuring cups that were labeled liquid or dry. They were all, they, they, they were all just one, they were all just cups. They're not labeled, but there's something. Uh, a dry measuring cup doesn't have a pouring spout and a liquid measuring cup does. So if it's got a pouring spout, it's intended for liquids. Well, how bad can I mess up if I, if I use uh, if, if I just use the dry measuring cups to measure my cup of milk that goes in You the can recipe. mess up pretty bad because I actually experimented with this in my own kitchen. I got all my measuring cups and I borrowed some from neighbors and measured and there was as much as three to four tablespoons, which is a quarter of a cup difference in volume between dry measuring and liquid measuring. So, you know, that can be pretty significant if you're making a cake where, you know, measurements are very important. If you're making a pot of soup, it isn't going to make a bit of difference, but if you're doing a cake or something where ratios of dry and liquid make a difference, a quarter of a cup is a is a big margin. I want to come back to uh, a point about food before yes. we quit, <laughs> but the other thing that was impressive to me about your book, and I want you to talk about it, is that the that a recipe is enriched by a story that goes with it. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, when those of us who are making our family cookbooks we remember the story, but we don't tell it. And how, how do you encourage people to go ahead and write down that story uh, that goes along with the recipe? Well, jot it down while it's on your mind, because if you're going to share that recipe with a family member or make your family cookbook or whatever, you have a reason for picking that. It has triggered something evocative or memorable, or you wouldn't be picking it. Write down that reason alone. And when you write down that reason, I pick this out because 
you have your first sentence. And that may be the only sentence, but that might trigger another sentence and another recollection. And you know, family recipes are valuable, precious family history and cultural history. Women that were too busy to write down anything else about their lives often wrote down recipes to leave to their children and say, well, it's a family legacy. And I think if you wanna know how people live, lived and live now, ask them what they eat get into that part of thing because it really is a key to who we are in our communities and within our families. Well, I want to talk about your uh, community and your your stories about your grandmama and the mountain environment right. that you grew up in. Um, North Carolina mountains in some ways are uh, different from the rest of the state. In some ways, they're really at the heart of what mm -hmm. North Carolina is mm -hmm. all about. And how does your mountain, how, how do you look back on your family and uh, growing up in the mountains and is that who you are right now? That is very much who I am right now but it wasn't in the middle. You know I obviously grew up in Watauga County in near Boone and you know I had a wonderful storied grandmother who kept a huge garden and tended the farm and was a good farmhouse cook and all that and you know when you're growing up with something you don't have the perspective to realize what it is. It's the only life you know. But when I went away and studied writing it quite honestly wasn't until I became a professional cook and went to Europe to become a really good Mediterranean cook and started spending time in Italy that I found a renewed respect and appreciation for the food I was raised with. I found that I had gone halfway around the globe to eat the food that I was raised with in Watauga County. And it was an epiphany. It changed everything about my career, my point of view, and my cooking that, you, you know. tell the story of sitting up on a mountain. I was, I was, tell, in a, tell I was, I was on a mountainside. We... I was on a mountainside in these blue mountains. I was on a farmhouse porch outside a farmhouse kitchen. We were eating soup beans and greens and stewed apples and biscuit cake and all this stuff. And I was in Italy. I was eating the food of my childhood, looking out at the landscape of my childhood in the mountains of Italy. And it changed everything because I realized if the food had cultural relevance and deserved respect and consideration there, it deserved that same contemplation, respect, and appreciation back home. And I realized that those two things, my dual passions, my childhood in the mountains, and I'm so glad to be from a place that is a place, that sense of place and identity, and who I became as a professional cook actually had the same soul, and it was all in my soul, and that's the story I wanted to tell. Well, so many things I want to I want to talk to you about it. we don't have time. Will you give us just a sort of a 45 second lecture on recipe testing and what you have right. to do to be sure that it's right when I test a recipe, I turn my cap around, I say. I get out laptops, measuring equipment, scales, computers, flow charts, and I am like being a science writer. It isn't science when it gets to the reader, but it needs to be very precise science in my kitchen to make sure it's legitimate information that then is easy and non-scientific for my reader. Wow. Now, um, you've written the new Southern Garden cookbook. Is there mm -hmm. going to be a brand new Southern Garden cookbook or are you done? I may be done with that topic, but since that's the way I cook in my heart and soul, there will be other books from me that have that point of view, but not necessarily that same topic. For those of us who now, having been inspired by you, mm -hmm. would like to try something like this, mm -hmm. is there a source that you found that you would could get good training and advice for writing uh, there these are, kinds There of are books? a few things, but you know, uh, you, you basically, you have to make sure you have something to say. And I said that <laughs> earlier, but seriously, there are, a lot, there are a lot of cookbooks and a lot on the shelf. You need to say, what am I with my recipes saying that hasn't been said before? And you may find that the biggest gift you can do for your own cooking is to write that down for your own family, that that's where the treasure of your food story will be as part of your family's legacy and not necessarily on a bookshelf, and, need, and they're both valid writing projects. Well, uh, I, I thought I'd ask you um, if you're going to if you have another project underway. Oh, it's spinning. It's spinning. I can always tell when I'm ready to write that when I walk my dog, I have to stop and start writing notes in a little sheet of paper in my back pocket. And when my back pocket's full, it's time to write either a magazine article or another book or something. 
Um, well, Sherry Castle, I wanted you to talk, uh, I wanted to hear more about some of these great, I will call them recipes, but they're great food dishes that are inspirational in part because you can taste them just from reading about them and also because you've, uh, I think, given us the confidence to try some of these uh, wonderful dishes with fresh food that look like even people like me can bring them to the table. So thanks for writing it and thanks for sharing it with us. Thank you so much. Well, our guest has been Sherry Castle. She's the author of the new Southern Garden Cookbook, What Fun We Had Today. And if you'll join me same time next week, I'll be right here to introduce you to one of North Carolina's wonderful writers. Funding for North Carolina Book Watch is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV, and by the North Carolina Humanities Council.